welcome, welcome to this evening's event. Welcome to all of our friends online um, watching as well. Um, we're about to begin here. Um, and just to let everyone know, at, at the end uh, of the evening, we will be taking questions from those of you in the audience and those of you watching uh, online. About three quarters of the way through the, through the event, uh, you'll see a QR code uh, pop up on the screen. And that's where you can use uh, your uh, device to uh, uh, log in and, and, and register your questions. And we'll, we'll take them there. And then um, we'll get to all the questions, obviously, but we'll, we'll address uh, as many of them a as we can. Uh, now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce all of you to the moderator for this evening's conversation. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Johnny Moore. Johnny is a popular speaker, business person, and acclaimed human rights and religious freedom activist, best known for his consequential work at the intersection of faith and foreign policy, especially in the Middle East. He's the president of JDA Worldwide and president of the Congress of Christian Leaders. Reverend Moore's many awards and honors include the Simon Wiesenthal Center's prestigious Medal of Valor, he was twice appointed to the U.S. Commission for International Religious Freedom by the President of the United States. Reverend Moore's peacemaking work in the Middle East recently earned him the distinction of being one of the world's top 25 young visionaries by the Jerusalem Post. He's a founding member of the ADL's Task Force on Minorities in the Middle East, an advisory board member of the University of Haifa's Institute for Religious Studies, a fellow at the Townsend Institute for Leadership and Counseling at Concordia University, Irvine, and the vice chair of the board of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. His own academic research focuses on religious track to diplomacy in Arab and Israeli peacemaking. Please welcome a good friend to Pepperdine and a wonderful friend to me personally, Johnny Moore. It's, uh, it's funny, the young visionary um, uh, comment. I, I just turned 40, and so I'm just glad to still be young. Um, I, it's, a, it's a wonderful privilege uh, to, be, to be at Pepperdine, to be back at Pepperdine. It is my, my favorite university in the United States. This President Speakers series uh, brings together distinguished scholars and thought leaders representing diverse points of view to examine topics and issues that face our communities in the world today. It seeks to inspire meaningful dialogue in the pursuit of truth. The series provides opportunities to cultivate an engaged and impassioned collective through civil discourse. That's what this series is about. And tonight's topic on the challenges and opportunities of faith-based higher education institutions uh, is, that's, that's the topic this evening, or as I've, uh, I'm going to summarize it to make it succinct, faith in higher education. This is a topic that has a long history in the United States of America. It, it took only six years for the Puritans to start the first university in the New World. That college at its heart emphasized the integration of knowledge and religious principles. The school was Harvard College, and it wasn't the exception. In the early 18th century, Yale was referring to itself, saying that its primary goal was that every student should consider the main end of his study to know God and to lead a godly, sober life. There were nine original colleges in America, like Princeton, which was founded by the Presbyterians, Brown by the Baptist, Rutgers by the Dutch Reform, Dartmouth by the Congregationalist. Six of those nine colleges were founded in the immediate aftermath of America's first great awakening, perhaps demonstrating a direct connection between early American vibrant faith and quality education. And the story of America isn't just a Christian story either. This is a country where religious freedom is enshrined in the first clause of the first sentence of the First Amendment of its constitution. One profound example uh, is expressed by George Washington himself in a letter to America's oldest Jewish congregation, where he wrote, may the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the good will of other inhabitants. 
while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there will be none to make him afraid. In fact, it was in that same letter that some of George Washington's most famous words appear. The government of the United States gives to bigotry no sanction. So while students at Harvard or Yale might require a professor of history, literature, or religion to explain to them the Hebrew Bible verses sketched in stone on their vestibules, that's not the case here. Faith is very much a part of the life of this university, America's highest ranked Protestant school, Pepperdine University, and also that of our guest of honor this evening, Rabbi Ari Berman, the fifth president of Yeshiva University, a university founded in 1886, a university which pioneered the concept of Torah Umada, bringing together a commitment to secular knowledge and Jewish religious knowledge. And since his investiture in 2017, Rabbi Berman has grounded Yeshiva University in its core Torah values. He's helped the institution grow exponentially. He's introduced over 20 new graduate degrees in fields from cybersecurity to health and STEM, established new academic centers from the Emil A. and Jenny Fish Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies to the Rabbi Jonathan Sachs Herrenstein Center for Values and Leadership. Most recently, Yeshiva University launched a new master's degree in Jewish studies for Christian students. And carrying on the legacy of Jewish thought, which has emerged from Yeshiva University among distinguished clergy scholars like Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, and Rabbi Norman Lamb, whose memories are not only a blessing to Jews, but non-Jews alike. Rabbi Berman is an active and erudite spokesperson for the Jewish community. He lectures worldwide. He writes extensively on Jewish uh, thought, modern philosophy, trends in higher education, and he is our guest of honor tonight. Please join with me in welcoming to his inaugural visit to Pepperdine University, Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman. And joining Rabbi Berman for this keynote conversation is someone who needs no introduction here. Regarded by many, including me, as one of America's top university presidents, his love for this community is apparent to anyone who meets him. It's my privilege to also welcome to the stage the eighth president of Pepperdine University, Jim Gash. So gentlemen, uh, tonight, we're here to discuss the challenges and the opportunities of faith-based higher education. But before we do, the entire world has had their eyes fixed upon the Middle East over the last two weeks as a horrific terrorist attack in southern Israel resulted in the single largest loss of Jewish life since the Shoah, since the Holocaust. Since that moment, I think it is apparent to all of us uh, that our world has been shaken. It seems um, everything has changed in just two weeks. And so it also seems appropriate that we begin and take a few minutes on this topic uh, before we get to the main topic of, of this evening. So Rabbi Berman, uh, I understand that you were in Israel on October 7th. And so I'm wondering what it was like to live through that and to live through the last two weeks as a Jew and also as the president of, of Yeshiva University. Thank you so much, Johnny. Thank you for your warm words and your introduction. Uh, thank you so much, um, my dear friend Jim, uh, for your warmth and hospitality, Jolene, for welcoming me and uh, uh, Rabbi Rakoff and Yal Evgi uh, into your home. Uh, it really is um, such a warm feeling uh, to be here in Pepperdine, and I. I feel uh, so close, even though it's my inaugural visit, I feel like I've, uh, I'm returning. So I thank you, I thank you all. Uh, it's a particularly a poignant to be here tonight. Uh, first, um, I want to extend my uh, deepest condolences and heartfelt grief at the tragedy of the loss of uh, these four uh, angels and what the Pepperdine community has, uh, has been going through during this time. 
and uh, just my, my, my words of support and comfort and love to you, to the families and to this entire, entire community. Um, you know, it's, it's this, you know, it's almost this spirit of uh, solidarity and grief that I think uh, very much touches upon the, the time period that we're in. So I was in Jerusalem on October 7th. I was in synagogue when we heard uh, the siren go off, which indicated an aerial attack. And then we all had to run to a safe room, and then it happened a second time, then a third time, then a fourth time, and we knew that Jerusalem was under assault. I walked home from synagogue uh, with my son. We're Sabbath observers, so we don't carry any electronics with us. And we met a friend, and somebody said to my son, you know, you should really go get your phone. My son went uh, back to the apartment, he got his phone, and we found out that he was called up to duty. My son is a reservist in a combat unit in Israel. And he got his uh, clothes and he took a bag with him and then I sent my son off to war. I don't wish that experience on anyone. So the... Um, the feeling of both, uh, you know, deep concern uh, of what is presently happening right now, uh, plus the enormous pain. Uh, my wife, who was in Israel, we, she stayed with, uh, she didn't want to leave with my son in the army and other children were there, volunteered to, to perform the last rites ritual that we have before burial for the victims in the South. They had to be taken care of. And she said that you can't imagine what happened. Meaning the state of the, you can't imagine the brutality of what happened the inhumanity. So the, the enormous grief of living through the greatest atrocity that happened to the Jewish people since the Holocaust is certainly you know, heavily weighs upon us. So with the sense of grief, with a sense of, and the sense of concern currently, I would close by saying there's also a deep confidence because we know that we will win because God always wins. And there's a pasuk, there's a verse, Netzach Yisrael lo yishaker, that the eternity of the God of Israel does not lie and does not falter. And we know that what will happen in the future, we only pray that we reach that time. Uh, as uh, expeditiously knowing that, being comforted, knowing that we trust in God in wherever he takes us. And that is, uh, you know, deeply our greatest comfort at this moment. Uh, I think it's a compliment to all of us uh, that you have expressed that you feel at home uh, here as if you've been here uh, before. Um, and that may be a reflection of our of our shared values as well. Um, I don't know if President Gash, you want to add? Yeah, let me, let me first say how painful it has been for this community to lose those four young angels struck down in the prime of life through a senseless, careless act. As hard as that is to imagine, and it is that hard to imagine, I sit next to a friend where 1,400 were struck down, not by a careless act, but by an intentional targeting of innocent civilians. And where my friend next to me is sitting here with his son already deployed, 
waiting for the order to put himself in further harm's way. And the fact that you would be willing to come be with us during this time is not just admirable, it's humbling that you would decide, I said I would come, and so I'm going to come. And so I hope you and those that you love and those that are part of the yeshiva community and the larger community know how much we are with you and we are praying for you and that we will continue to pray for you until your son comes home, until the sons and daughters of all the idea of soldiers come home. And so as a, as a law professor, I was trained in the law before I came to Pepperdine's position as president. And so as I look at these matters, I look at them analytically through the eyes of, of legal analysis, where you look at principles or rules, and then you apply them to facts and see how those facts align with or don't align with the principles. And so as everybody here, I assume, knows well, Pepperdine is a Christian university. Period, full stop. There's no historic, we are a Christian university committed to Christian faith and Christian values. And among those Christian values, we hold dear as the sanctity of all life. We hold dear the golden rule, treat others, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And as we look at what is happening around the world, around universities in the world, as they are responding and trying to analyze what's happening. And some places are putting out statements and other places are doing different statements. And, and Pepperdine has a pretty consistent history over the last several years of, of not putting out a statement on geopolitical world affairs. It does not mean that we do not have opinions about these things. It does not mean that we cannot do analysis and say what happened on October 7th was a clear, unequivocal, atrocious violation of all principles of all people. Any equivocation about that is dishonest, or worse. Rabbi Berman circulated among a number of university presidents a statement that he wrote that clearly and objectively analyzed what happened. In his condemnation of Hamas for what they did, the clear, clear statement of standing with Israel and standing with the Pal Palestinians who were under the cruel rule of Hamas and standing with people of goodwill and moral character was unequivocal. And if I was going to be writing a statement, that's the kind of statement I would have written. Because there is no equivocation. There is no moral quandary as to what happened on that day. And I know this community stands with you on that. There is so much political analysis that those can do about what happened before, what's going to happen since, but we mourn every life that was lost on that day, and we mourn every life, whether it's a Jewish life or a Palestinian life, a Christian life, a Muslim life, we mourn every life that is lost in the response to that as well. We mourn those lives, but we are not unclear as to what happened on that day. And so thank you for being here. This, this evening's um, conversation is about uh, the role of um, faith in, in higher education. I, I think we've just seen a demonstration of that <laughs> uh, just in the, um, in, in the answers just now. But uh, the two of you are each products of faith-based um, education. And uh, maybe we should start there and, and start with you, Rabbi Berman. Uh, 
why did you choose uh, to get a faith-based education uh, if that was a choice that you made? It's a great, uh, that's a great question. Um, certainly from my youth, uh, this was understood and expected. <laughs> um, I'll tell you a story. Uh, first, before I tell you a story, let me just thank Jim for his kind, uh, his kind and heartfelt uh, words and the, uh, the truth that underlies it. And uh, it's really deeply and much appreciated as your friendship is, and uh, I know it and, and feel it. Um, so, I was in Yeshiva University, uh, and I was speaking to our students. They had a student, uh, um, student leadership uh, retreat. So I told them the following story, this was uh, a year ago, that I was just in my uh, parents' home in Jerusalem, and um, I brought uh, back with me uh, two pins. Uh, one pin was, it said Yeshiva University, student council president, and it said my father's name on it. And the other pin said Stern College, which is our women's college of Yeshiva University, and Stern College student president, and it had my mother's name on it. And they actually met at Yeshiva University. They were set up by the president of Yeshiva University. <laughs> so um, we've had deep roots at, at Yeshiva. I'll just tell you the postscript of the story is that six months later, I had a visit by two students who asked me if I'd give a blessing under their canopy, their wedding canopy. They met on that retreat. And they were so moved by my parents' story, they were inspired, and they asked me to deliver a blessing at the canopy. Um, so I always knew I was uh, uh, coming to Yeshiva University. That really wasn't, uh, uh, that wasn't a question. Uh, but the, the way that it has infused my life uh, with values and meaning and purpose, and what faith uh, does to transform uh, you know, has been, was deeply embedded uh, for my education. And I am so proud to be the president of Yeshiva University and to continue a tradition. You know, when people ask me, I am, I'm in conversation a lot with uh, many college presidents and uh, uh, many people from this country and beyond. They say, I understand, Rabbi, how can you speak about Yeshiva University as 3,000 years old? Like, how can that possibly be? So I explained to them that we start the beginning of Yeshiva University when Moses received the Torah at Sinai. That is the beginning. And we transmitted faithfully the tradition from generation to generation to generation. And what we'll be doing is educating the next generations of students to continue that even further. And it's such a blessing to be here and to be in this position to transmit our tradition faithfully and rigorously, while at the same time preparing them and society with the latest in, in uh, academic rigor and expertise and knowledge, you know, both for our Jewish students in our undergraduate schools and our graduate schools for our non-Jewish students as well, to prepare them to be people of impact and make a difference in their communities and our society. So the rabbi story begins 3,000 years ago. So what about yours, Jim? <laughs> we go back to creation. <laughs> in the beginning was the word and the word. Like Rabbi Berman, my parents went to Pepperdine. His went to Yeshiva. And everything changed. My mom's, my mom's um, father had worked at Pepperdine uh, pr prior to that, and her brothers had gone here. But my father uh, didn't come from a place of faith when he arrived at Pepperdine. And everything changed here. He, he developed a, 
a deep and abiding faith in God while he was here. And so as us four kids were growing up, this Pepperdine was our school. That's where we were going to go. And yet, uh, we were all athletes as well. And the, the sports that we played, Pepperdine didn't have. My brother was a pole vaulter, one of the best in the country, and ended up going to Stanford. I was a football player, and we don't have a football team here yet. <laughs> no. So was my little brother. My little sister was a really good volleyball player, but she wasn't really, really good at volleyball. So uh, my three siblings, my, my younger two siblings and I went to Abilene Christian University for, for faith-based higher education. We wanted to be at a place that, that prepared us for our vocation, but also did so in a community that valued what we valued and the opportunity that I had to get to know professors and to be loved by them and known by them in classes that were small enough where they knew me and I knew them. And then the opportunity I had to finally get to Pepperdine for law school. I applied to one law school to go to law school. I, I loved every moment of, of my legal education here and made it my goal while I was here to be a professor at Pepperdine Law School because of the men and women who, who were the faculty members. And I know that's true for so many of our faculty members now who are faculty members because when they were students here, the impact that their, their professors who came from deep faith had on them. And so when I had the opportunity to take the baton from my predecessor, Andy Benton, you know, it's kind of interesting. We're, we're 87 years old and I'm the eighth. You guys are a hundred and something year old and you're the fifth. You've got a long... Uh, journey ahead of you my friend if you're going to keep up there's a story behind that but yeah so so yeah just just the my kids all came to pepperdine um because they wanted to be a play at a place that shared their values and cared about them as individuals and gave them opportunities like like very few places do to, to study abroad and maybe we'll talk about that later but we've got campuses all over the world where our students go out and be among the people around the globe and become global citizens and learn what God's creation all around the world looks like, not just here in Malibu or in the United States. I think uh, people in communities of, of faith understand, um, you know, learning and faith and uh, education is a part of the religious experience. But I think a lot of people outside of Christian institutions or, or, or Jewish institutions uh, sometimes find it strange, you know, what what is the difference between going to a religious school versus a a non a non religious school? Like, is it does, does faith come first? Does academics come first? Like, how, how do you how do you explain to people that don't understand? You know, what the difference is? Why do people choose this path? Uh, it's so um, you know when, when we talk about yeshiva, I always talk about it. it's deeply rooted and forward focused. And um, the deeply rooted part uh, transforms. It's because we're deeply rooted that we can be forward focused. You know, the rabbis say that a tree that has deep roots does not um, overturn in torrents and storms. And the stability that one has and the ability to draw the, the nourishment uh, from one's tradition to enable a life of productivity and creativity, which is a blessing, not just to themselves and their community, but to the broader society. I mean, that's what we, that's what we do. And we're, we're doing this, you know, our, our students walk with a greater sense of purpose. You know, Jim spoke about athletics. So um, we have at Yeshiva a very robust athletic uh, uh, department. And a couple of years ago, actually, our basketball team uh, was renowned because we played Division Three, and they were number one in the country. They actually were at a 50-game winning streak. And it was on all the channels, the ESPN, New York Times, they all wanted to cover Yeshiva University. The Jews were winning in basketball. <laughs> we had and international media attention, it was remarkable. People were waiting online to get into our arena. And we begin every game by singing two national anthems, the Star Spangled Banner and Hatikva for the State of Israel. And you have 
playing on the court. Students who weren't just the first in scoring, but also were the first in helping an opponent off the floor when they fell. That they were playing with the kinds of sportsmanship and character that we imbue and that we inspire. And they were doing all this while they have a dual curriculum. At yeshiva, every single undergraduate student studies Torah, has Torah studies during the day, and then academic studies. Their days are so packed. Most of them, after they finish their academic studies, then return to the house of study, no credit, on their own to spend many more hours studying Torah. In all of this, the basketball team has to wake up at like five in the morning in order for them to practice and be able to go to prayers three times a day and continue the rigorous schedule that is Yeshiva University. But what they've, what inspires them is that they know that when you play for Yeshiva University, you're not just playing for a school, you're playing for people. And that sense of purpose, that when they're on the court, that they're actually there to sanctify God's name. is true for every graduate in whatever court they play. Whether it's the court of law, whether it's in their uh, boardroom or cubicle, every place they go, their goal is to sanctify God's name in the world. Yeah, I'll, I'll briefly answer the question. Um, our basketball players, Practice a little bit later than 5 a.m. <laughs> um, 50 game. Have they won streak. 50 in a row? I was going to say 50 game winning streak. Uh, I, I might. There's a lot I would do for a 50 game winning. Streak. I'll just put it that way for a 50 game winning streak. Uh, I, I, I don't really have a basis to compare firsthand what it's like to be at a a secular school versus a Christian school. Though, as I mentioned, my older brother went to Stanford. We were quite close. We lived near there, and so I spent a fair bit of time with him um, during his time there. And, and while it was an incredible academic experience, it was very different than what we seek to have here at Pepperdine in terms of what values that we have. Uh, the, the question of, of is it faith first, is it academics first? I think at Pepperdine, we would probably answer the question, yes. You know, we, we are we're seeking to be the premier Christian university in the world. That's what we're seeking to be. And we're not seeking to be a Bible college. We're not seeking to be a secular academic institution. One, one way one could look at it is we are an excellent elite academic institution on a faith foundation, set on a faith foundation, an immovable faith foundation. I love the way you said deeply rooted. We often say firmly rooted. Our, our, our roots go, go deep uh, in faith, and, and that matters to us greatly. You cannot become a tenure or tenure track faculty member at Pepperdine without being an active member of a community of faith, period. That's what we require. They don't have to be Christian. We have several uh, faculty members who aren't Christian, but they are an active member of a community of faith, and they make us better as a Christian institution. The depth of conversation the commitment that they make to students who are from their faith traditions to support them. So uh, I can't conceive of, of working anywhere else than in a faith-based institution. I can't conceive of going through what we went through as a community for the last 10 days without being in a faith community to walk together, to pray together, to cry together, to call out to God together, to, to look to the future with hope together because we know this isn't the end. So that's, I think, how one can look at the differences uh, between our communities, higher education communities, and others who don't claim a, a creator and a, and a God that we trust. Rabbi, how does, how does the Judaism influence the way you balance secular knowledge and religious knowledge? How do you integrate these? You know, for, for us, it's essential um, that our core Torah values 
uh, impact everything that we do. So I speak about at Yeshiva five core Torah values. Um, the first is truth, is emet, is that we seek truth. And um, I'll just go through them quickly, but go back to truth as the basis. Uh, it's seek truth, it's live your potential, the infinite human worth of each, of each person, is live your values. We don't just study it, we bring it out into the world. It's act with compassion and bring redemption to others. I mean, this is our core Torah values. And everything that we do is inspired by the values that start from Sinai. The values of, for example, of seeking truth, which is the core of the academic enterprise. And what we found is how faith enables one to even believe in truth. And this period of time is actually a great expression of the importance. You know, I haven't seen this till these past two weeks. The, um, the way that relativism has removed the ability of university leadership from issuing truth statements. So we were, we, as Jim mentioned, I have been uh, speaking to presidents around the country now about issuing a simple statement about the fact that Hamas is a terrorist organization. Not just the one atrocity that they did. Their stated goal is to destroy the Jewish state and kill all the Jews. So we should, it should be pretty easy to start every conversation by saying Hamas is a terrorist organization and that the Palestinians are not represented by Hamas. They're in fact harmed by Hamas. Very basic. And the idea that university leadership cannot say as Jim just spoke about. They cannot say the words because they believe that the purpose of a university as a bastion of freedom of speech is to host conversations, not to be the conveyors of truth, not to teach the students the truth, not to base the conversation on truth, to be a host of a conversation. And what I explained to them is that in order to have a conversation like any uh, moderator or mediator would know. You need to set some ground rules first. You can't invite somebody who is pro-genocide and who's seeking to destroy your people into the room and say, okay, now have a conversation. Like You have to make it clear. But the idea that universities can't convey truth underlies and, and, and hurts uh, their ability to govern and to um, conduct and drive their students to live moral, uh, uh, productive lives. So I think we're, we're seeing right now, you know, the, the, the way that our religious values affect our worldview. Now, I'm happy to share that I have met uh, true uh, leaders in the world of higher education. And it's not just what the news stories are saying. And I, you know, I have, we've now over 100 college presidents, university presidents, who've signed up to the statement all around the country, from California, Texas, Florida, North, South, East, and West. So this idea doesn't need to uh, uh, corrode our higher education. It just needs a, clar a clarity that the mission statement of a university, as all of their banners actually declare, is part of it is truth as an undergirding for the whole enterprise. So that is one example where I think faith-based universities can remind all universities how essential this is to undergird 
the whole enterprise of what we're trying to accomplish. Are, are there disadvantages to uh, faith-based education? I'll let Jim talk about that. <laughs> uh, I'll answer that question, but let me follow up and just say, um, I'll just add a, a concurrence, a concurring opinion. Those of you who know Pepperdine know that we have a Pepperdine affirms statement. And one of those statements says, truth, having nothing to fear from investigation, should be pursued relentlessly in all disciplines. And so we are absolutely committed with you, Rabbi Berman, to the seeking of truth. And that seeking of truth doesn't always come from point A to point B. It can come through dialogue that is pointed and sometimes unreflective. But what needs to happen is what uh, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis said, the best remedy for bad speech is more speech, not silencing the bad speech. Now, there's a lot of instincts within me that would like to silence bad speech when I see it. But we learn when we have conversations with those who disagree and question each other's foundational points and then arrive at a place of light where we can see truth and understand truth. And we may ultimately disagree on our vantage point of truth, but there is truth with a capital T. We may not be able to see it clearly, and we believe that as an institution. We also, as an institution, believe in radical hospitality. Uh, the, the provost before the previous provost, so three provosts ago, Daryl Tippins used to say, the best test of how Christian of a university we are is how welcome non-Christians feel. That's the test of whether we're living out our faith is welcoming those who don't share our faith commitment. And one thing that, that I, I am thrilled to see continuing at our law school is during the, the holiday of Sukkot, we have a sukkah on campus mm -hmm. for our Jewish students who are, who are Orthodox to be able to continue to do what they're doing, but also to observe their holiday here on this campus. And that's critically important to us to be welcoming to those who disagree. But it's also critically important for us to tell the truth and respond to bad speech with more speech. And sometimes that isn't as easy as, uh, as we're seeing throughout college campuses around the country right now. Now, in terms of disadvantages uh, of a faith-based- I was wondering if you're gonna get back around to it. <laughs> I'm gonna get there going to be a short answer. I think, I think there are those who would look at faith-based higher education and say, you know what, if you really want to maximize the probability of getting the most elite job possible, there's a handful of schools to go to for that. And so a disadvantage of going to Pepperdine or to Yeshiva, at least in theory, would be the, the Wall Street firms, the white shoe law firms, etc., conceivably would be less open to you. And yet, 98% or more of Supreme Court law clerks, those who reach the pinnacle of post-law school job, um, the, the, the height of the job, 98% of them come from a small group of schools. Three of them have come from Pepperdine. There's almost no schools that are of Pepperdine's age or national reputation that have had any schools, any student clerk on the Supreme Court. So why have they selected three of them from Pepperdine? I think it's because they know what they're getting. They know they're getting people who are highly educated by excellent faculty members and people who also believe in truth and are gonna operate with integrity. You look at Congress right now, you know, of the 400 and 35 members of the House, three of them are from Pepperdine. There's not very many schools, and on both sides of the aisle, not very many schools that would be able to say that. And so the idea of, yeah, there's a disadvantages, um, I think they're more hypo hypothetical than real. And, and I, I can't conceive of, I mean, I'm, we gave our children the opportunity to go over they, wherever they wanted, but they chose 
to come to Pepperdine because they see the advantages and I, see the, I think they see clearly the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages to have professors who know you, who care about you. Right now, schools like Yeshiva and Pepperdine have been greatly punished by the US News and World Report by saying the size of the class doesn't matter anymore. They used to count how many classes were under 20 and how many were above 50. And Yeshiva and Pepperdine do very well in that category because we think it matters for your professor to know you. We have very few classes in here. And now, all of a sudden, it is no longer part of the analysis. And as a result, both of our schools were you know, dropped in the rankings. And so, yes, there's disadvantages. And I'll just say one last thing, affordability. It's tough because the way to do education the way we do education is expensive. We could fill up this room and say every class is, has 350 people in here. And we would need one professor instead of 20 to teach that group of people. And that one professor would not, would not know their names, would not know their family members, would not have any relationship with them, would not be blessing their marriages, would not be performing their marriage ceremonies. It would be a much cheaper way of doing education. It's not worth this, the cost savings. The way we do it is because we care. Every single student is, an infinite, is of infinite dignity and is a child of God and deserves our attention. And so there's a disadvantage there of doing higher education in the way that values students, the way Yeshiva and Pepperdine does. That's really said so nicely. <laughs> that was amazing. Gonna, next week, the rabbi is going to be speaking to people. And he's gonna be <laughs> that was amazing. And so true that as one of our core values is infinite human worth. And it expresses itself in the student faculty ratio. And that our rabbis and teachers are your research professors, meaning the, there's no TA. They're working there. I that they're going to write your recommendation. You're not going to, you'll know them personally and you'll have a relationship with them all throughout your life. And they won't just help you find a job, but they'll be at your wedding canopy. And that's a fundamental difference. But it is true, as the president of the university, the affordability and the need for scholarship, you know, becomes uh, part of the enterprise as an essential. If this is if this is the um, uh, type of university experience which is so necessary for our community to build on, uh, then the need for um, for donors and benefactors to be part of that. Uh, becomes all the more uh, all the more essential. I just say one more thing though. It's it's going to it's very important because it's a question that's on my mind now. Um, as I'm speaking to college presidents around the country, and seeing that anti-Semitism is real, and the the tinderbox uh, that is uh, college campuses on many, not all, not even most but on a number of colleges. And the idea that bad, the, the answer of bad speech is more speech, I think is challenged when it comes to hate speech. And that is one of the fundamental questions that universities are dealing with now, which is hate speech and leading to violence. And I can tell you that the fear is real. So how universities govern that uh, without, you know, and I believe that the necessary start is to, is truth actually, the necessary start is to make clear uh, the boundaries uh, is, is one of the challenges of higher education that we're seeing play itself out in the world. And I'll just say one of the few statements that we have on our website is against hate speech. Right. Um, we'll have a, f a few minutes uh, at the end for your questions. Okay, so here's how we're doing that. A, a QR code will come up on the screen momentarily. Um, you can grab your phone. If you have a question, you could send it in uh, on the on the QR code. And I see a lot of activity already, so maybe I need to save a few more <laughs> a few more minutes for the questions at the end. But um, you you can do that while I ask uh, 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 the, the next question. And I have multiple questions now after everything you just said. Um, maybe maybe a short answer to this one, and, and then we'll we'll go to another one. Uh, you're both committed to truth. These institutions are committed to truth. 
um, that doesn't mean that everyone's going to agree all the time. And, a, and a, a, a founding purpose, as I read it, for this presidential speaker series is to um, to teach how to convey, you know, in civil discourse on, on these on these types of issues. In our world today, that seems easier said than done. And so, so what do you do when when the community is legitimately divided? Like when people, you know, refuse to agree upon upon truth. Like how how do you handle that that piece of it? So I believe, look, these are the difference between, let's say, a faith-based university and um, your, your liberal education uh, uh, college is, you know, thick versus thin, you know, that, uh, that Walter has this um, important distinction between, you know, communities that have a thick uh, bond and set of principles that they're all adhering to, and then more diverse community that have a thin layer uh, that still attaches them. You know, for faith-based communities, faith-based education, this, it's very thick. Like, it's not just the academics and the sciences and the liberal arts. There's also a whole series of faith teachings. There's a whole sense of what truth means, and it'll be different in different uh, um, institutions. Um, but there's a whole... Uh, there's a whole series, you know, as I said, our students are studying probably, you know, an equal if not more, depending on the student, amount, spending an amount of time on their Torah studies as on their academic studies. But when it comes to other institutions, you still need that thin layer. You still need something that is, is bonding them. And while it's true that um, in most cases, you can argue there's sometimes where the truth is unequivocal. And if you never find that layer, then your conversation will descend to chaos, and I believe actually to violence. So you need, you actually need a layer of about the pressures. And again, it's very, it could be very basic, like any group that commits to genocide is bad. It can be very basic, but if you can't get there, if that doesn't undergird your institution, then the whole thing will collapse. And these are, this is the fault line that we're seeing a fault line in the foundation. You know, so even with, the, it's not arguable. You know, it's not about politics. If there's no basic moral truth that we can all agree to, and there, it, it, that's, it, it's, you know, and, and that's what we're getting college presidents to understand. You know, and I think we're getting there, actually. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be uh, reasonably quick. Uh, I, I like what Rabbi Berman says, like, peel it. Childproof, here we go. <laughs> peel it back until you get to something you can agree on, and then build back up from there. And so, for example, you know, we have, like, many universities in the country we have a, a we call it vice president for community belonging that you know is really our chief diversity officer and one of the things that i appreciate so much about jay jay gooseby smith dr jay gooseby smith and there's a lot to appreciate about her but the conversation begins with similarity rather than difference how are we similar to each other let's start there and we as a Christian institution, you as a Jewish institution, can base that in faith. And so we have a foundation upon which we stand when we talk about diversity. And that, that, that faith is the power of God and his plan for this world. And when we talk about resilience, and Dr. Connie Horton, our Vice President for Student Affairs, and her groundbreaking work in resilience starts with faith. If you're trying to build up your mental health capability, your, your ability to withstand failure, put your feet into faith and then stand from there. And every aspect of what we do is grounded in faith. And so if we can start with how we're similar and work up rather than start with how we disagree and work down, then we're going to be a whole lot better off. So uh, many, many institutions uh, began as religious institutions. I, I mentioned some of them at the very very beginning here, and I'm, I'm pretty sure most of those institutions would not be preferred, referred to as faith-based institutions anymore. Um, 
And so, my, and Jim, I'll start with you on this. Um, wh why do you think this happens? And is it, a, is it an inevitable, natural cycle that religious institutions just eventually blend in with, with, with everyone else? Is it, it, just, uh, it just has to happen? Uh, because it seems to have happened to almost all of them. Yeah, I will say it's, an, it's a natural cycle. It is not an inev inevitable one. And what we, what, I've not done the research, but I've read it. And if you're looking to, to understand how faith-based institutions secularized and did so in mass, mass quantities, then read James Birchall's Dying of the Light. Dying of the Light. And what he talks about is it, it's, it, there's, an, there's a truism in American higher education that there's not a single university from the beginning of the Republic that has maintained its faith commitment unless one of two things was true. Either that institution has a statement of faith that all of the leaders and the faculty members and often the students have to sign, or, and that's not Pepperdine, we're, we're non-creedal. We, we've, the churches of Christ have always been non-creedal. We're not going to be creedal. Or the second is to have a, a denominational affiliation to which you are tied. You can you nail one foot into the ground and you can walk around in a circle with the other foot as long as that one foot is nailed there. And, and there isn't a single exception, not one exception in the history of American higher education of any school who over time has maintained its faith grounding other than one of those two ways. And that's how Pepperdine does it, is through re remaining committed to the churches of Christ. Now, reasonable minds can differ as to what numbers qualify as what uh, Birchall's book calls a critical mass. We don't like the term critical mass because that assumes other people are not critical. Everyone is critical. And yet the idea is there's got to be enough people committed to that particular denomination or particular faith tradition such that it doesn't drift. You never lose voting control. And that's, that's how Pepperdine has done it. And that's how Pepperdine will continue to do it as long as I've got this baton. Rabbi Berman at, at Yeshiva University is, uh, are all the students Jewish? So our uh, undergraduate students, um, of course, one doesn't have to be Jewish to come, but one has to commit to studying many hours of Torah a day. So uh, they tend to uh, <laughs> towards that. Um, and our graduate students, uh, you know, we just have, we have top tier graduate programs. And, uh, you know, we're blessed. I, I was just, um, I met a couple of months ago, the, uh, I was at our graduation for our CAT School of Science and Health, where we're housing, you mentioned all these new degrees, and on the one hand, cyber and tech and AI, and on the other, all the health fields, which are uh, really exploding in its popularity, and, you know, physicians assistants and speech and language and health, and uh, um, occupational therapy, and next year we're starting nursing, I meaning it's, it's growing. And the, uh, the a woman came over to me, introduced herself, and she said that she was just appointed the president of our alumni society. I said, so nice to meet you. She said she's from Bangladesh. She's a Muslim woman, and she found a home in yeshiva because here they respect her values. And what we found is that all across the world, People are coming to Yeshiva University, Jews and non-Jews, because there's a respect for the infinite human worth of each person. I was sitting, we, had a, we were at a baseball game at, um, uh, you know, in the beginning of the, of the year, and there were 500 Yeshiva University students and some alum who came, and I was sitting next to one from our Cardozo Law School. They have an LLM uh, program, and I was explaining to her, you know, the game it was the first time she's ever seen the game. So I said, where are you from? And she said, I'm from Syria. Like, this is the most amazing experience, what's happening at Yeshiva, which is we have students from Middle Eastern countries who come and study at Yeshiva because here they respect their values. So I, I believe that higher education and the environment that's fueled as a value-based education has the ability uh, to reach and to make connections.
uh, that would be impossible otherwise. And by using one's core Torah values, you know, the, the, that fuel uh, both our Jewish and our non-Jewish students, we're able to help educate the leaders of tomorrow. You know, clearly a, a distinction of yeshiva is the, the commitment to have stu studying the Torah. I, I think at Pepperdine University, I mean, one of the distinctions of this institution is that uh, it, it's, it's global um, emphasis. And in my experience, like wandering around the world, it's like, oh, there's a Pepperdine campus there. There's a, one in Switzerland and one in Florence. And, and it's, it, it's just, it, it's a part of the institution here. How does that shape the, the Pepperdine experience? And, yeah. and where did that come from? Is that from the very beginning? Or? Uh, fairly early in the process, uh, Pepperdine's first uh, international campus was in Heidelberg, Germany. Uh, and we're in London, in Florence, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in Vevey, Switzerland, and um, what am I missing? Washington, D.C. Um, we're, we're, we're soon to be opening back up in the Far East. 80% of our sophomores study abroad for a semester or a full year. And, and where it came from was this belief in the global education of a, of a student will make them a better leader in the world. Understanding and learning cultural humility isn't a natural thing growing up in the United States. And so being able to travel abroad and, you know, we, we don't, we have these study abroad campuses where these are our campuses where our students are taught by our professors. This isn't a, a, a an exchange program. It's not a partnership. This is, these are Pepperdine campuses. And yet they go into the communities and they travel. And then we have programs where our, our law school's global justice institute, our Sudra Global Justice Institute, has students in prisons all over Africa, helping them deliver due process to their people, embedded within the judiciary. We just signed today with our, our um, Pepperdine Center for Faith and the Common Good, a, a kind of sole researcher for Prison Fellowship International for all of their faith-based rehabilitation program analysis. And we've got here my, my colleague, our co-executive directors of this, Byron Johnson, where we are going to be sending faculty and, and students into prisons in Colombia, the, the country of, not the district of, Sometimes you wonder which one was, was, is more challenging. Um, to, to ensure that we're basing the decision making of prisoner rehabilitation on data as opposed to on supposition and trying to export that around the globe to ensure that those who are incarcerated have the opportunity to become rehabilitated through things that have been demonstrated to work, which is faith-based rehabilitation. And so it's a, it's a core DNA part of who Pepperdine is to expose our students to the world and help them become world leaders and world citizens through the cultural humility that, learn, that comes from that. So uh, we, we have to get to um, kind of the core, the core question uh, for the evening about challenges and, and opportunities in, in faith-based education. So um, I'll, I'll just... Uh, why don't, why don't we start with the challenges, uh, and then we'll and then we'll go to the to the opportunities. As, as each of you sit in your at your post, at Yeshiva University, at Pepperdine University, you look at the world in front of you. Um, you know what what are the what are the challenges? I um, I think Jim actually summarized it well uh, before. Uh, I think the um, the opportunities. Are um, are so vast because it's it's it transform how how you view every action of your life. You know, I love the fact that Jim spoke about uh, prison reform. You know, and we just opened up uh, the Perlmutter Center for Legal Justice. Uh, Cardozo, our law school, uh, was the founder of the Innocence Project. So we've just opened up. Uh, in addition, we have of the Innocence Project, there's now the uh, Lori and Ike Perlmutter Center for Legal Justice, which uses uh, science to free prisoners or free people who are falsely imprisoned. 
Um, we have a clinic at Cardozo that has our students uh, go into death row to advocate for the prisoners who are being mistreated on death row. And, and I think this actually, to me, is one of the most telling um, elements of the character of our institution. Because it's one thing to rally behind people who are actually innocent. But these people are guilty. And they're on death row. And our students are in the prisons making sure that even for those souls that they're being treated humanely. That's the kind of spirit that you bring throughout your life. It gives your life meaning and purpose. There is no dollar sign. There is no other success point. There's no more metric that you can have and that by the end of your days, you look back and say, that was a life well lived. Beautifully said. Uh, one of the challenges of faith-based higher education is there are, there's a, a secularization of our world. There are, there are fewer and fewer people who reach the age of, of going to university who are deeply committed to faith. And so there's, there's this culture of, of secularization. There's also the cancel culture. There's the deep polarization in politics that, uh, if you're not careful, bleeds into uh, faith-based conversations. There's also, we talked about the, the question of affordability. Um, the, there's, there's an elitist dismissal of faith-based institutions that if you believe in a creator God who wants a relationship with you to whom you pray and who interacts with your life, then you're not serious about things of academia. That dismissal, that condescension is challenging, uh, though we will not be deterred. It's just a, it's, it's just a part of life. You, know, you look at the reputational rankings in the US News and World Report, and you see a clear and demonstrable bias against faith-based institutions and reputation. It's just everything else, same, same quality of students are higher publications, and then it's the reputational sneering against faith-based institutions, and, and fine. I don't actually care what you think. And yet, the rankings cause people to make decisions based upon where they think the opportunities will be, and so that, there's a challenge there. Yeah, it's, so, it's so interesting hearing it, um, because our whole undergraduate enterprise is so different in that um, our feeder schools are, like, as I said, when I grew up, I always knew I was going to Yeshiva University. It wasn't, it wasn't, really, a, it wasn't really a question. And we are um, so full, we're so at capacity, and we have a wait list now that's longer than we've ever had before. And now, due to this very unfortunate situation, it's the demand is of, of Jews just not feeling safe in other colleges, you know, is forcing us to try to create new infrastructure. They're to, welcome here. <laughs> good. We need places. Uh, who, whoever thought that this would be the case, you know, that, that a safe haven <laughs> would be necessary. Um, but we, we, uh, we see great demand. Um, and also for the jobs, as like we have, it's now at YU, six months after they graduate, 97.6% of our students are in the job or graduate school and of their uh, choice to have their life destination. Like they, the students, you know, the, in New York, 
you know, Yeshiva University student is sought after. And they get hired in the top, you know, Wall Street business firms. And they get hired, and you know, all throughout. Um, and uh, you know, so I, you know, that for us is a strength. That you know, coming to Yeshiva is a ticket uh, for you. Um, uh, so it's interesting to hear the, you know, the conversation. Uh, I would just say one one more thing about this, and and Jim and I actually met in a CCU uh, conference, and I feel so blessed to have, um, you know, friendships and alliances uh, with our Christian universities, and I've learned so much from their presidents as I've learned from as I continue to learn from Jim. And I remember that I was sitting on a panel of presidents of faith-based universities, and the question uh, came up about challenges. And, I, and, and people were feeling almost overrun by the culture, that it's, you know, it's so counter-cultural, you know, and being faith. And I wasn't sure, it could be that we're so used to it. I'm like, they, they, it sounded like, it was almost like persecution. I'm like, listen, we're, we know what persecution looks like. This, this isn't it. This, you're not experiencing that. But, but more than that, um, I think it's a moment for faith. You know, if you take innovation and take all of the changes that's going on in the world and all of the issues, you know, the, the, whether it's the, you know, the self-driving cars and all the ethical, the AI and, uh, all the ethical issues that are emerging. You know, MIT started an uh, uh, innovation and ethics center, and what did they do? They had a survey of what do people think in self-driving cars, and the trolley car dilemma, you know, do you hit 10 people? Do you? They took a survey. We have 3,000 years of tradition of nuance and substance to build upon. The world is waiting for faith right now and for answers and directions to some of the great human matters that are occurring as we speak. So I believe that this is a moment of faith. And I believe there is a crisis in America. It's not a crisis of faith. It's a crisis of meaning. And people are seeking meaning. And they're not finding it in the ephemeral answers that's being offered by the consumer society. They're looking for the covenant. They're looking for something transformative. And that's what we're offering. That's what we're giving. So I think this is a time for faith. And this is a time of opportunity for our institutions. I mentioned this at a conference in uh, Washington. And one of my friends from another faith-based university started to do research. And he said that actually, if you look at the college trends, a college is down right now in the general world. Faith-based universities, it's up. So I see this as an auspicious time. And I think we need to, you know, speak. We need to speak it so that it is clear, not just to our community, but to our nation and to the world. Uh, you, you've spoken a lot about answers. You have an audience that wants answers uh, to, <laughs> to questions. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through, um, I'm going to... Yeah, if, yeah, we can put it up one more time, um, though we have a lot of them. Uh, we'll only get to a few of them. Uh, we'll ask a, a Jewish question, then a Christian question. Okay, yeah. we'll which start with the. Which one's going to answer which? <laughs> <laughs> it's, up, it's up to you. We'll start with the Christian one. Um, uh, as a Christian student in a graduate campus of another university, um, a secular school, I feel uncomfortable professing my Christian beliefs due to professors who don't identify as Christians. Um, and to openly discuss ideas that conflict uh, with my with my Christian values, how do you handle a situation uh, like I'm in? I haven't been in your situation, but I, I will say that. Uh, let me just offer you words of encouragement. Um, as Rabbi Berman said, the persecution that that I that we have felt as Christians in this country pales in comparison to what what he and his community have had for a lot longer than we have. And 
And yet, and yet, they speak truth. And that truth doesn't always come with bouquets or, or candy or accolades. It comes with persecution, but it also comes with a sense of obedience to your maker. And the, the Bible says that, you know, you will have trouble in this world, but fear not, I have overcome the world. And so it's easy for me to say, sitting here as a president of Christian University, just buck up and, and you know, say what you're thinking. But uh, I, I will tell you that I will be praying for whoever it is that you have the courage to do that and that you will find people who will listen to you and who will uh, give you the opportunity to, to be heard and that you will feel like that you are emboldened to speak truth even though truth isn't accepted. Truth is. And so I encourage you to speak it. But, but I, I don't say that as someone who, who has walked your journey, as someone who has been in Christian higher education my, my entire educational career, and uh, both as a student and as a, as a professor. Rabbi, do you have any advice for the Christian? Hmm. <laughs> or transfer to Pepperdine. That's the easier right. thing. It's much easier. <laughs> um, what we uh, teach our students is to... Um, it's not just to be proud of who they are, but that is part of their mission. Uh, and, um, you know, when they are uh, kind and honest and decent, that they're not just uh, living their life, but they're, they're doing something greater. Um, and they're living with purpose, and they're sanctifying God's name. So there's a higher calling uh, wherever one is. Um, so we uh, encourage our students to, uh, to speak uh, their values publicly. Um, we've said this very clearly uh, up until these past two weeks, I have to say. Uh, we have Jewish students who are afraid, physically. So I don't know yet what to say from these past two weeks. It, it shouldn't be that way. Um, so uh, you, you, uh, when you look back at history, you you look at events uh, like um, like the Holocaust and these sorts of things, and you sit in your history class and you sit with your professors and you ask yourself, how do these things happen, right? And it and it does it does seem like uh, in front of our eyes, you know, in in living color, uh, this is how this is how things decelerate, you know, or accelerate, you know, rather. And so uh, it just gives me personal pain. I think a lot of us that that, that we're that we're looking at this uh, the the current. Uh, rise in anti-Semitism to start like can I, can I just say on that and I really appreciate that Johnny and I'm telling you, people people uh, Jewish people right now are triggered and thinking back on the Holocaust there's no question and people have said to me what you just said that this is this is what it must have looked like in the 1920s and early 1930s and that's why I can't I can't tell you how important it is for the Jewish people uh, to understand that they're not alone right now. And some of my, the greatest inspirational conversations that I've had in my life have happened the past couple of weeks. Um, I have, uh, I spoke to one college president from a faith-based HBCU. And um, she said to me, Ari, she said, the Jewish people, uh, in the Bible, the Jewish people are successful when Moses holds up his hands. But who holds up Moses' hands? It's Aaron and Hor. Where you're Aaron and Hor. You can lean on us. We will support you. Um, and I think that, and that's, that's, that is what is part of what is driving my efforts right now, which is to show the country, you know, what is the right direction to take, but it's to show the Jewish people 
that we're in a different we're in a different place and we can but we need to gather the angels and we need to stand together and make sure that it doesn't happen because we can do that uh, you, you set up the next question, actually, <laughs> uh, the Jewish question, uh, which is um, Yeshiva University is uh, uh, from a particular Jewish tradition. So, so what do you, you know, what role does Yeshiva uh, play to the to the broader Jewish community? You know, the, I mean, Reformed and Conservative and Orthodox and and, and all all across the board. How, how do you view your role in that? Yeah, no, we are. Uh, we I feel as the president of the nation's leading Jewish university, uh, that all Jewish students are our students. And that is why they won't be able to do on their campus. They, we're not going to allow it. And we're going to be calling our, uh, use all of our uh, partners and allies. And they're all our souls. And um, you know that sense of responsibility is what what drives me. And uh, you know, thank God we live in a time uh, where we have partners and good people uh, standing side by side with us. So I I certainly see uh, yeshiva um, as uh, an exceptional uh, place uh, right now. Uh, you know, I mentioned basketball. This actually one of the first experiences when we started winning and we went to the NCAA tournament. The first game was in, um, it was someplace far in Pennsylvania and they, it was on a Friday afternoon. So it was impossible for people to drive from Yeshiva to go there where Sabbath observers, we wouldn't be able to go. And the basketball team goes and the whole stands are filled with Mac fans, with Yeshiva University fans. And they turn to them and they say, what is, who are you? And they say, we're from the local reform temple and we're here to support our team, Yeshiva University. And that's the sense is that when Yeshiva wins, the Jewish people win. And I can tell you when the Jewish people win, the whole world wins. You know, so that is the spirit that animates us deeply. There was a, a powerful moment uh, when we were having dinner uh, just before this event where um, uh, Rabbi, you started talking about light. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, did, I didn't know if you wanted to reflect on that as we... Oof, I so do. I'm so happy you brought that up, John. I got this great uh, medallion about light. And then I saw it all over this uh, campus. And um, I have to say that this is, this is the image that I've been thinking about these past two weeks. You know, inspired by Martin Luther King that um, only light uh, drives out darkness and only love drives out hate. You know, when God created the world, the Jews throughout the world started reading Genesis a couple of weeks ago. You know, each, each Shabbat, each uh, Sabbath, we read a different portion of the Torah. So we started Genesis just a couple of weeks ago. And the first act of creation is that there was chaos, it was dark, it was waters. What's the first act of creation? And God said, let there be light, there be light. and there was light. And what I pointed out, and I said this, it was on CNBC, on Squawk Box, it was like this business show, and I started telling him about Torah. And I said, and God said, let there be light. That you have to speak it. It doesn't just happen. You have to speak it and you have to articulate it. And then there will be light. And then you could differentiate the light from the darkness. And each person, and I love seeing this on your walls, each person is a light unto the world. And you have to speak that light and the world will see it. Evil cannot bear the light of the truth. It cannot bear it. And that's why I know that Netzach Yisrael lo Yishakir. I know what the end uh, will be. You know, and, and, and this 
uh, I couldn't think of a better, more fitting uh, expression uh, for us and for our country at this moment than being the light to light up the chaos and bringing truth into the world. Amen. Uh, I, I think we all uh, are, are leaving this uh, leaving this conversation with um, uh, in, inspired, challenged, uh, things to keep an eye on. I, I, I think a, a good excuse to lose the inferiority complex about uh, about faith based education and incredible an incredible future. Um, Jim, I'll give you the, the, the last word, uh, but before I do, I'm just noticing, you know, aside from so many of the, the university leadership here, all the people that are watching online, um, I've noticed a number of interesting people in the crowd. I, I see um, Archbishop Joseph D'Souza, who leads the All India uh, Christian Council, who's visiting from uh, Hyderabad. Um, I see Omar Kudrat, uh, who leads uh, the Muslim Coalition uh, for, for America and Afghan uh, American, uh, Gia, uh, Gia Chacon, who leads an organization that stands up for persecuted Christians. Um, and then uh, um, uh, the uh, very good friend and inspiration to me, uh, the Associate Dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the Chair of the U.S. Commission for International Religious Freedom, Rabbi Abraham Cooper is here. So I just wanted to um, you know, welcome them also for, for coming, uh, coming this evening. And President Gash, this is your, uh, this is your house, and so you get the, the final word. My final word. Um... It's just a word of gratitude, first of all, to you, Johnny, for coming out. For those of you who, who only met Johnny Moore for the first time tonight, I hope it's available online, but his testimony before the European Parliament, European Union Parliament two weeks ago uh, was powerful truth that uh, needs to be heard uh, for your, your friendship, Johnny, and for your deft leading of this difficult conversation and all that you've done for Pepperdine over the the time that I've known you as, as one of our valued public relations consultants. Gratitude for all of you for coming to spend this evening talking about faith-based higher education and the, the challenge that our world is facing right now. But my deepest debt of gratitude is to you, Rabbi Berman. Uh, and please know that I'm confident that everybody in this room is going to be praying for you and your son tonight and for the sons and the daughters of every member of the IDF that is in harm's way right now, and every member in that region who is in harm's way right now, that God would protect them and keep them, and that this would come to a resolution in, in a, at a time where Jews and Muslims and Palestinians and Israelis and Christians and everyone in the world will stand in solidarity for truth. and, and, and and in the, the Christian Bible, in Revelation 7, where we're standing with one voice singing, every tongue, every tribe, every nation singing with one voice to God and glorifying his name. And what you do at your institution is just that. You glorify God's name. You, you train young men and women to be leaders to glorify God's name. And we share that in common with you. And uh, I... I want to say that this institution at Pepperdine is now a better institution for having you as a dear friend. And so God bless you and God bless you all. Thank you for coming this evening and stay tuned for the next opportunity to be involved in the president's speaker series, which is coming in a couple of weeks, Richard Haas, former head of council for foreign relations uh, in a couple of weeks. So thank you for coming. God bless you.